This is Lecture 1, Overview and Terminology. Uh, the course has three parts. The uh, first part of the course, covering about the first quarter, is descriptive statistics, that is, the summary and visualization of data. This will take up, as I said, about a quarter of the course. Uh, it's relatively easy material, but it will go very fast. The kind of thing we will look at are graphs representing data and statements uh, summarizing data. So, for example, this chart relates the approval rating of presidents 22 months before their election with the eventual margin by which they won or lost the election. This sentence is taken from some newspaper in 2009 discussing Wall Street bonuses during the, rece the recession. The second quarter of the course will be devoted to probability. Probability is the quantitative investigation of likelihood, uncertainty, and randomness. Uh, it is going to be the most mathematical part of the course, and in some sense the most abstract, but we will get fairly concrete. We will talk about real life, semi-real life things like gambling is a great example of uh, probability, but we'll also talk about truly practical matters like this this fact, which is that after the increase of airport security after 9-11 caused a reduction of airline travel by about 6%. Most of those people who didn't fly drove. Uh, if you figure those additional car miles have the same probability of death from a car accident as a typical car mile traveled, you find that that increased airport security resulted in about 400 more deaths per year. So that gives you some sense of what you can do of a practical matter with probability, but the second half of the course will be devoted to the central topic of the whole course, which takes descriptive statistics and probability and puts them together into inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is drawing probabilistic conclusions from uncertain or incomplete data. Express that broadly, it covers almost any decision-making process, or at least any decision-making process that you do in a uh, quantitative context, but it is the central tool used to do science and to make decisions in business world and the policy world. Uh, kind of thing we'll look at is studies about effectiveness of antibacterial soap. We'll learn what the word significant evidence means. This is the deepest part of the course. It is tremendously interesting. Uh, and it's what we're heading towards. There's a general framework that everything that we do in this course follows from the very first day to the last day. We will always be considering a population. Population is the collection of all things called individuals that you want to consider. So your population might be all people. That's, of course, where the population individuals language comes from or it might be all houses, or all colleges, or all possible rolls of a given die, all possible samples of a hundred people from a thousand person town. Any of these could be a population. Usually they have the word all in them. Once you've chosen a population, there are questions you're interested in asking about each individual. Those questions are called variables. They're properties of the individuals. So in our, in the cases I gave here, if your population is people, interesting questions you might ask about each person are their height, their GPA if they're a student, number of siblings they have, their favorite color, the gender. All of those are variables. Variables come in two distinct flavors, and this is a distinction I will ask you to be able to make to recognize whether a variable is numerical or categorical. Uh, and later on in the course, it may right now seem relatively straightforward to you, but later on in the course, when there's a lot more going on, you will, be bene you will benefit greatly by having automatic the distinction between numerical and categorical. So this is an important thing to pay attention to. A numerical variable is a question you ask of each individual whose answer is a number. Uh, numerical or quantitative, you call that. A categorical variable is a multiple choice question, a question whose answer is one from a list of possible values. When you've 
answered non-essay questions on the test. On, on tests throughout your life, they've probably always been multiple choice or had numerical answers. Sometimes they may have more complicated answers. So I want you to take a moment and look at the variables in the examples below and decide which ones are numerical and which ones are categorical. You might want to pause the tape here, make sure you've done it because I'm about to give it away. Okay. Those highlighted in red are numerical variables. The, a person's height, that's a question whose answer is a number. GPA is a number. Number of siblings is a number, and so on. On the other hand, these highlighted in red are categorical variables. Your favorite color, the answer is one from a list of possible colors. Your gender is one from the list of male and female, and so on. That's a really important distinction. Each of those kinds of variables has a distinction within them. Much less important, uh, numerical variables can be discrete or continuous. A discrete variable is one that, like the in integers, the possible values are separated and none of the values in between are possible. You can't have two and a half siblings. Continuous variables, like the real numbers, have infinitely many possible values, and between any two values, there are in fact infinitely many possibilities in between. Uh, so examples below, again, take a moment. Uh, this is a bit subtler, but clearly number of siblings is a discrete variable. It can only be an integer. Likewise, number of bedrooms and the value on the die. On the other hand, height is a continuous variable. What can your height be? It can be any real number, or any real number within a range. Uh, GPA, perhaps that's a little subtle, but it, it, no reason why it couldn't be any real number. You might think that cost is a discrete variable, and you could reasonably argue that, because cost can only, only make sense in most contexts to the nearest penny, although that's not true at the gas station, where they measure things to the nearest tenth of the penny. Uh, Many variables like cost, if you think deeply about what the situation is, becomes very fuzzy, whether it's numerical or continuous. All I can tell you is that won't ever be a problem for us in real life. The distinction will be very important in theoretical context. It won't be a big deal when you get to the level of refinement where you're worrying about those things. The distinction within categorical variables is a little more straightforward. A variable can be binary if there are two possible answers and it can be multiple choice or whatever. There's not really any word for it if there's more than two. So again, look through the examples and identify which is which. Uh, gender only has two possibilities, so it's binary. Any yes or no question, lots of, lots of uh, categorical variables are yes or no. Any yes or no question, like does it have a porch, does it have a business school, are binary. Whereas favorite color, of course, there's more than two choices. Once you've understood what your population and your variable or variables are, we get to a parameter. A parameter is a summary or description of the variable in a population. So, for example, if your population is all voters and your variable is whether or not the person's going to vote for your candidate, so that's a binary categorical variable, what would be the natural way to summarize the information about the whole population? Well, there's really only one question you could ask, which is what proportion or percentage of all the voters will vote for your candidate? That's certainly the most interesting question. Uh, proportion or percentage is more useful, it turns out, as we'll see, than the total, the number of people who would vote for you. Of course, if you want to know whether you're going to win the election, that's the question. Is it more than half, right? We will express our parameters in the format that I just did, which expresses the parameter, the variable, and the population, right? So here when I say the proportion of all voters who will vote for the candidate, I'm telling you the parameter is the proportion, all voters is the population, and whether they'll vote for the candidate is the variable. So that noun phrase there contains all three, and that's how we will most often express parameters, and I will ex expect you to be able to do that in specific situations. Here's another example. Our population is all U.S. colleges. 
maybe the variable we're interested in is the tuition. That is a numerical variable. What would be the best way to summarize the results for all colleges? Probably you thought average, and that is going to be our most common parameter when we're talking about numerical variables. Average tuition of all U.S. college students, notice once again, I've expressed that as the parameter, average, the variable, tuition, and all U.S. colleges, that's the uh, population. That's all great. The problem with parameters is you never know them. The reason you never know them is because mostly populations are too big. I shouldn't say never, but in the case, for example, of all voters, there's no way you can ask every voter what they think. By the time you were done, some of the voters you asked would have died and some new voters would have registered. So you'll never ever know the answer to the question, what proportion of all voters will vote for my candidate? We will always be interested in parameters. This is the fundamental conflict of the course. We will always be interested in parameters and we will pretty much never know them. What do we do? Well, the basic strategy is to take a sample. What's a sample? A sample is a subset of the set of individuals, that is, a small subset of the population, which we actually gather data about. And we hope that it's representative. Right? So, you know what samples are, because and in exactly this context, when people want to know what proportion of voters support a certain candidate, they do a survey. They do a phone survey of 2,000 voters and ask them, who are you going to vote for? That is a sample. And if you keep that example in mind, you totally understand samples. It doesn't have to be done that way. All sorts of things can be samples. If you are interested in what the average tuition of all college, U.S. colleges are, maybe you live on Long Island, so you just look up the 30 colleges in Long Island. That's a sample. And then what do we do with that sample? we again summarize or describe the variable in the sample. Here is a theme that runs throughout the course. The distinction between population and sample is so hugely important and can be so subtle in specific situations that statisticians have developed entirely separate languages to talk about them. We'll see in a little bit that they even use different alphabets to talk about populations and samples. <clears throat> Part of that language is that when you uh, do a summary or a description of the variable in the population, you call it a parameter. The exact same concept for a sample, a summary or description of the variable in the sample, is called a statistic. So populations have parameters, samples have statistics. It will be hard to keep straight, but notice the two beginning with P and the two beginning with S help you unravel it as long as you stop to think. So, if we did our phone survey of 2,000 voters, the statistic we would be interested in is the proportion of those 2,000 voters who support the candidate. That's the statistic. We hope that that's representative, that that gives us some information about what the parameter is, but all we know is the statistic. Likewise, the statistic we would be interested in for those 30 colleges in Long Island is the average tuition. Okay, that's all of lecture one. When I end each lecture, I will tell you two things. One, I will tell you what you should be able to do having watched the lecture. That is, what should you have learned from this lecture? In particular, that's the kind of thing when you have watched the lecture, I might ask you on a quiz. The second thing I will tell you is things that you should be able to do once you've processed the lecture. By that I mean there's lots of things I've told you about, not in this lecture, but in most lectures, there'll be lots of things I tell you about that you need to do some examples, ask some questions, work things through for a while before you're able to do them yourself. So there will generally be two lists of what I expect you to get from the lecture. One is right away and one is get ready to get your hands dirty figuring out how to do this. In this case, what you should be able to do after this lecture is define the terms that I've defined. Population, parameter, statistic, and sample. I say that, but I very rarely ask you to regurgitate a definition. I'm much more interested in your ability to use the definition. So I'm much more likely to ask you to do something like the second point. 
describe a situation and ask you to identify what the population, the variables, and the parameters are, and, and to express the parameter in the full form that I talked about. That means you know those definitions, if you can do it in a real situation, separate from whether you can regurgitate the words I gave you. Likewise, I expect you to be able to distinguish between numerical and categorical variables in given a description of the situation, and to recognize, up to some subtlety, when a numerical variable is continuous or discrete, and when a categorical variable is binary or multiple choice. And finally, I expect you to be able to identify a sample and a stati statistic, and to pronounce it, and to distinguish those from the population and parameter in a given situation.